Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you here this morning uh, on the Sunday before Christmas. Uh, so I uh, just uh, there are a couple year-end reminders there in the worship folder. Uh, check those out, and don't forget that Christmas Eve service is six o'clock on Christmas Eve. And um, overflow, if we, we reach our maximum here, overflow will be in the Cooper House. We'll live stream there. Uh, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, there'll be elders over there uh, to uh, distribute the elements and uh, have the service as well uh, over there. Okay, uh, any announcements for us this morning? All right, and I see James and Aria coming in to light the candle today. So I invite them to come up. Mm -hmm. Good morning. morning. Today our Advent reading is the reading of love. This is the candle of love. Oh, (laughs) again, mask. This is the candle of love. See? Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the Good Shepherd. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others, and sharing with others. It is a time to love as God loved us by giving us his most precious gift. As God is love, let us be love also. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find these words. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, Mm -hmm. the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. Mm -hmm. You shall also love the stranger for you, candles, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. From the Gospel of John, we hear, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let us pray. Teach us to love, O Lord. May we always remember to put you first as we follow Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives. As we prepare for our celebration of Jesus' birth, also fill our hearts with love for the world, that all may know your love and the one whom you have sent, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let's go light some candles. Grab my music. (laughs) Please join me in singing our Advent carol, Emmanuel.
Good morning. Welcome to Central on this last Sunday before Christmas. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Luke 1. It's Zechariah's song, the first seven verses, Luke 1, 68 through 75. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Will you pray with me this morning? Almighty Father, from the beginning you have loved us. You have promised us a Savior. And like Zechariah, your grace and mercy is so far beyond our understanding. As we gather today and wait these final days before Christ's birth, we pray you will prepare us, prepare our hearts for worship, prepare us for your service, prepare us for your glory. Like Zechariah, may our songs be pleasing to you this morning. The last few months have been especially difficult and uncertain for many around us. Many of our brothers, sisters, and neighbors are suffering trials. We ask that our worship this morning be pleasing to you and that you equip us so that we may share the love and peace of Christ with all those around us. In Christ's name, amen. Please remain standing as you're able and join me in singing our first carol, Joy to the World. <laughs> For our prayer of thanksgiving. Our gracious and awesome Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we praise you and thank you this morning that we are able to come together to be here together in your presence. Lord, that, that you reign and rule over the earth. 
over all the world, the seas, and everything that is in them, Lord, that you are God. And Lord, we humbly come this morning to you. Lord, we've experienced your grace and we've experienced your truth. And Lord, we pray that you would help us as we seek to make your message known to our world. Lord, to a world that's hurting, to a world that is lost, to a world that is very confused. Lord, that, that your light would shine in the darkness. That all men and women would know that you are God. We praise you. We thank you, God, for all that you have done for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in singing our next carol, Joy Has Dawned.
Let's affirm together what we believe this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our unison reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 15 through 17. Read with me. Thus saith the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, de declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your ch children shall come back to their own country. Now we'll see how this uh, passage from Jeremiah applies in, in just a few moments as we 
dig into the portion of Matthew. Uh, a couple people that we need to remember in our prayers. Uh, Bess isn't here because she's on bed rest um, for uh, until the doctor says she can get up. Okay, so James is cook and bottle washer and song leader and babysitter and everything. So. Um, we're going to pray for James <laughs> and for Bess as she uh, uh, sees the Lord work in these times and, and that it would be for her a, a fruitful time to just to rest before the Lord and um, charge up because she's going to need all the energy she can get, I think, when uh, another little girl arrives. And then, of course, uh, Miss Libby is the passing of Lynn. Uh, so let's remember the Cho family. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you uh, care for us in such a way that we, we cannot compare it to anything in this world. The prophet says, would, would a, a mother forget her nursing child? Well, that is the type of love that you have for us, that you could never forget us, that you could never set us aside, never uh, is your gaze not upon all of your children. We pray for Libby and the Holcho family, that in these days of, of mourning, they would understand your grace in a, in a new and a, a strengthened way, uh, that um, you have these things under control, uh, then, Lord, that you would give us the opportunity to minister to them. And the same with Bess and James and Aria, uh, that these days might be fruitful for Bess and uh, draw them close together during these days and prepare them for all that lay ahead. Uh, Lord, that you might be seen in their gentleness, that you might be seen in their steadfastness in faith, their devotion um, to you and their, their willingness just to take stewardship uh, of these children that you've entrusted them to, uh, that uh, they might be a blessing to them and they might grow up in the love and admonition of the Lord uh, to one day profess their faith and saving faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, you are, are good to us, you are merciful to us, and especially at this time of year, we're reminded uh, that your son left the throne and came and took on the form of a man, first, just like us, born uh, from a, uh, in a natural way, not conceived that way, but born just like the rest of us, raised but was without sin. So Lord, we pray that our eyes might be fixed both upon this infant, who is lowly, who is holy, but also upon the Savior who has raised up and has given his life for us. So we come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we pray together the prayer today that he taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just want to thank you for your faithfulness uh, in, in giving. And uh, plates are always at the uh, exit points uh, as we finish uh, the end of the year uh, strong that we might be a blessing to many. Cynthia. I have traveled many moons
right, let's open our Bibles this morning, or you'll find in your worship folder our passage, which comes from Matthew chapter 2, as we work through these uh, two chapters in Matthew here at this Christmas Advent season. So if you're able, would you stand with me as I read the Word of God? Our Heavenly Father, come upon us with your Holy Spirit, we ask, that our eyes would be open. Uh, that this familiar passage, these familiar words, would be alive for us once again, that we would see the great sacrifice that was made for us and that we might live today in light of that. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, and I'll read verses 13 through 18. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. This is God's inspired word for us today, so please be seated. Now, there are approximately 330 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, um, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John show that Jesus really is the only one uh, throughout history who has fulfilled them uh, by his life, by his works, by his deeds, by what he said. Now, that's important because in the first century, there were quite a few imposters who would come along and say, I am the Messiah, and they might do some, some uh, magic tricks or something like that. But because they could not fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies about Messiah, they were shown to be false. Now, Matthew, as we have seen, more than any other gospel writer, goes to great lengths Uh, to show that Jesus' birth, his life, and his death are rooted in the Old Testament. Remember, his audience is Jewish. So the the book of Matthew is written to that audience. So those things were very, very important and stood as the basis for the coming of the Messiah. Matthew mentions he was born of a virgin, Isaiah 7. Born in Bethlehem, Micah 5. Sought out to be killed by Herod, Jeremiah 31. Preceded by John, Isaiah chapter 40. Healed diseases, Isaiah 53. Spoke through the parables, Psalm 78. Came to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9. His, Matthew gives the deliberate use of the Old Testament. So we will see here uh, in our passage, he's going to cite two places for us. Um, if, you, if you have your Bible, verse 18 usually stands out on its own and is kind of isolated as often is done Uh, in the New Testament when there's uh, more than just a phrase from the Old Testament that is quoted. And then verse the end of verse 15, out of Egypt I called my son. Now at first glance that may look like, oh, well, what does that mean? That is quoting the prophet Hosea chapter 11. So Matthew actually deals with four places in these first couple of verses. And the prophecies that are linked to those geographic locations. Bethlehem, Jesus is going to be born there. Egypt, he's going to be called my son out of Egypt. Ramah and Nazareth. Now we're going to look at at Egypt just briefly here and what that means. Ramah is a little bit more difficult and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, you'll see. So the first location in in, uh, verses 4 through 6 is Bethlehem. And as I said, that prophecy comes from Micah chapter 5. That is well known. We we, 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 uh, quote that and read it every Christmas. The second location, it comes in at the end there, out of Egypt. And remember that after the wise men departed, being warned by God, the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take your child and flee to Egypt. Um, 
So he arose and he took the child and the mother to Egypt and it fulfilled the prophecy from Hosea. Now Matthew can rightly claim this prophecy applies to Christ because he's talking, Hosea is talking about Israel as a nation in its immediate context, okay? But he's also talking about the fulfillment of the, the desires of, of what Israel should be and should have done and what they should have been in the Old Testament. And he's saying that that is fulfilled in Christ. That what they failed to do in the Old Testament as a nation, Jesus has fulfilled it here in his coming out of Egypt. I'm going to quote here from a, um, you'll, you'll be able to tell it's a scholarly article because it doesn't sound like me, okay? <laughs> Matthew looked back and saw the similarity between the history of the nation of Israel and the history of the Messiah. Hosea 11's quotation by Matthew is not an example of arbitrary exegesis on the part of Matthew. He's just not looking for something to proof text what he wants to say. On the contrary, Matthew looked back and carefully drew analogies between the events of the nation's history, Israel's history, and the historical incidents of the life of Jesus. Okay? So he, what he's saying here is that the entire nation of Israel and their failure is a precursor to the perfect fulfillment of everything the Lord has in store for us in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus fled Herod, it brought the fulfillment of the work of deliverance when he calls them out of Egypt. Remember the Exodus, that's what he's saying here. He's referring to that. So Matthew can say this was spoken to fulfill the prophet. This is the perfect fulfillment in Jesus versus the failure of Israel in the Old Testament. Now it says in in 1415, we're told Joseph took the child and took it, the mother, Mary, while it was still night and left for Egypt. Now this is a pretty drastic uh, movement here. Now, of course, we know the angel came and told him to do so, but he's removing... Jesus from every family influence there. He's removing him from the culture that was so important to them. He's actually removing himself and Mary as well and taking them to a strange land, no cousins to help raise them, no grandparents, um, no familiar environment. And so they went to Egypt and probably to the city of Alexandria. And Philo, the historian, says, that by about 40 AD, there was a population in Alexandria of over a million Jews. So this was a place where a lot of Jews went. Most of them were from Rome because they were fleeing the persecution that went on uh, in Rome in particular. And so they arrived in Egypt. Um, And Egypt is also outside the jurisdiction of Herod. So even if Herod had heard that they went to Egypt, there, there was nothing he could do. He couldn't go down and chase them down. He could not get to them. So the prophecy out of Egypt is fulfilled in that way. Now this third prophecy, this deals with the location of Ramah. Let's read, I'm going to read again, 16 and 17. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked, um, and and we'll look at that word in a moment, tricked or mocked. It, It can be translated either way. By the wise men, he became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years of old, old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. So uh, we see this. Now, it's hard for us to get our minds around this at first. Why would Herod, in, in, it says he was furious. That doesn't really explain it in the English. That's not a... That's not a sufficient translation. In fact, we would need an entire sentence to sum up that word uh, furious here for us. So Herod decides to kill all the babies in the surrounding area just in case. And it's hard to know the exact number of male boys, male boys, of uh, boys that were killed in and around Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem was a little village at that time. And so the scholars that I have read, uh, maybe two dozen uh, in Bethlehem and around. This is not uh, thousands of, of, of uh, male children that were killed. Um, maybe uh, two dozen, three dozen, maybe. Okay, But perhaps, now this doesn't show up in the other Gospels, and it doesn't really show up in historic writings either. So maybe this was just business as usual for Herod. 
Remember, Herod killed his favorite wife. And what did Dan say? I'd rather be Herod's pig than his son, I think. Yeah, his pig than his son. Herod was a bad guy. Okay, so maybe just killing off a bunch of people at a time was normal for him. So the historians really didn't think much of it, except Matthew does. Matthew understands why this has happened, because it was to fulfill something from the Old Testament. Now, prophecies, we, we see prophecies are sometimes very specific. Micah 5.2, born in Bethlehem. While other prophecies can be somewhat general, applied locally, and then there are typological prophecies. Prophecies from the Old Testament that are pointers to, pointers to the sacrificial system, the death of Christ on the cross. So we see that in there. So when we look at the events and the actions of Herod, it's hard to explain these from a rational point of view, from the language and from the uh, actual activities there. Uh, but it would be, as we've seen God use these actions of, of evil men and women in other places, it would be in the providence of God to use this activity to achieve his purpose. Now, it's not like God said, well, how can I fulfill this prophecy from the Old Testament, I'll make Herod do this. No, Herod was bad. Herod was jealous. Herod was um, he, he was just a bad guy. So the Lord in his providence allowed this to happen to fulfill what he had been spoken. So there's no real rational explanation in our minds. Why would you go and have all of these infants killed just because of your jealousy? Well, first, as we see in verse 16 here, Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked. Now, this is a, a very good translation, tricked. You, in, in yours, uh, you might see the word mocked as well. Um, what happened was Herod felt that he had been tricked by the wise men. And, and again, the word was also mocked. So not only was he tricked he wanted something and they turned the tables on him but it was if they went like that to him and and mocked him as well by not telling him where the child had been born so the implication is that um, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword it's it's wor it gets worse than just being tricked okay so Herod is it says here it is furious now that does not cut it he is in a blind rage. That's what, really what the word talks about, a blind rage. So maybe you have seen somebody, or maybe you have been in that type of rage yourself, where you are simply out of control. You're throwing things, you're breaking things, you're, you're saying things that you would never say normally, but something has so set you off that you can't even control your, your, the words that are coming out of your mouth. People are looking at you and say, I didn't even know you knew those words. Where are they coming from? That's what's going on in Herod right now. That's what it means here. Um, now, you'll remember that in verse 7 back here, Herod summoned the wise men secretly to ascertain from them what time the star had appeared. So he had checked with the wise men, not because he, he says, I want to go worship too. No, he doesn't want to worship him. He wants to kill every rival. And then when he finds out that the wise men didn't do what he wanted them to, and there's a rival out there that could challenge his authority, he just goes ballistic. And the, the Greek word here is um, thumo, which means violent rage. But it's also passive. Okay? So it's not as if Herod is being rational here. It's not as if he has thought through a good plan and decides, I'm going to kill all these children just to be sure. Herod is out of control. It's as if the anger is running his life. The anger is running his thoughts and therefore his actions. So it's in a sense, it's what's being done to him by his anger. Now he's not, I'm not giving him a pass on anything, but we, we all, all kind of understand. You get angry, sometimes things come out. Well, he is so angry that he's out of control. So this response is totally, as we would say, out of proportion. Why kill everybody around? Because if he would have thought rationally, and think about this for a moment, if he would have thought rationally, he would have said, well, if the wise men were smart enough not to come back to me 
and tell me where the baby is, then they were also probably smart enough to go and warn the parents to get out of town so that I couldn't find them. That's rational, but that's not the way Herod is thinking. He is out of control, blinded by rage. He doesn't think about those things, orders the massacre of every baby boy in the area, and it would be difficult to imagine in, in our lives, I think, uh, the hardness of the heart of the soldiers. They're given an order. They go and do it. They open the door. There's a baby boy. They kill the baby boy. And you can imagine the screams of parents and, and the, the, the sorrow that goes on there. So why did Herod do it for everybody under two? Well, Scripture doesn't say, but remember, it's a blind rage. So he probably just pick that age just to be sure, just to be sure. And it's even worse when you realize that he was, had a pretty good idea this was the Messiah. Okay, He was going to kill the Messiah. This is, we, so we see at the very beginning of Christ's life, the rejection of all that he is by those he came to save. Now, the real question for us, and, and this is the question that I've had for years, um, why is this here? Okay, why is this included? Why does Matthew include this in particular? What is the theological significance of this action by Herod that it should be included in Scripture? Well, the short answer is it fulfills Old Testament prophecy. And you think, really? This is in, in the prophecy. This is the only gospel that is mentioning it. But remember, Matthew's writing to a Jewish audience. So we look at the prophecy that is listed in verse 18. And it really doesn't sound like it. Um, so I'm going to do my best to connect the dots for you uh, in a way that we can understand why in the world this is here. And what does it mean? Now we read the whole passage uh, together earlier. This is just the verse uh, 15. So what is the context here that we would be able to go back and see that why he would go to Jeremiah and mention this? Well, in context, this is not a prophecy in Jeremiah. It is simply a statement. But it, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew makes it a prophecy. Okay? So he comes back and says, this is what he was talking about. This is the perfect fulfillment of what Jeremiah was talking about. Even though he didn't understand it, this is how it is fulfilled. See, Jeremiah is foretelling the doom of a dying nation in chapter 31. We're given this, I mean, the, the circumstances are obvious. The, the people have been wicked. Uh, they've been disobedient. And Jeremiah is just brokenhearted over this. He's weeping over this nation. Um, because he knew nobody would listen to him. That's the thing about Jeremiah. It's told back in chapter 7 of Jeremiah. So you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer. So how would you like that call from the Lord? I'm going to send you to this group of people. You're going to pour your life into them. But I'm going to tell you at the start, they will pay no attention to you. They will not listen to you. They will not heed your words to repent. I mean, uh, that's the job everybody wants, right? But that's the job that Jeremiah had, and he was faithful throughout his life to do that. So Jeremiah weeps over this disobedient people because he knows, one, they're not going to listen to him, and secondly, they're going into captivity. Jesus weeps over people who won't listen to him. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her brood, but you would not. You kill the prophets. You stone those who are sent to you. So we have a similarity between the situation of Jeremiah and Jesus. Jeremiah sits in the view of a people that are doomed, and he weeps. Jesus sits in view of a people who are doomed and weeps. Yet in the midst of this doom, we see in both places there is hope. Jeremiah is talking about the doom of the Babylonian captivity. He's saying the Babylonians are going to come, they're going to take you out, and they're going to haul you away. And he says, but, next verse, that's 15, next verse, don't weep. There is hope in the midst of this. And even verse, chapters 32, 33, 34, 35 of Jeremiah talks about this fulfillment of a return after 
70 years in captivity, they're going to return. God says to Jeremiah, it's a sad day. There's doom. You can weep. It's okay, but now you can stop. You've had a little bit of crying time, a little bit of sadness, but stop because I will redeem them. I will bring them back from captivity. And the same thing is true in the use of Matthew's, uh, of Jeremiah's prophecy in Matthew. You have this tragedy. You have this terribleness that has gone on, the killing of all of these infants. But at the same time, there is hope because Christ has come. And we know why he has come. And there is a remnant that will be saved. And you can read that in Romans uh, chapter 11. At some time, the, the Jews who are in Christ will come back and will believe. Zechariah says they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. They're going to mourn for him as, as an only son. And there's going to be salvation again in the nation of Israel. Jeremiah spoke about doom. But he says, don't keep on weeping. It will turn around. It's going to eventually to result in salvation. Same thing is true with Christ. Christ was born. There was weeping for, because of the deaths of these innocents, these evil actions by Herod, the rejection, by Christ, the rejection of Christ by the chief priests, by the scribes, by the Pharisees, by the people. But yet Christ redeems. Now, that talks about Rachel. Or that talks about, you know, well, we'll see, we'll see. How do we connect Ramah and Rachel and Jesus? Okay, we're going to have to connect the dots here. Now, Ramah is a little village north of Jerusalem. Now, if you remember, there was the northern kingdom and there was the southern kingdom. Okay, they divided. You had Israel was the northern kingdom, Judah was the southern kingdom. And right on the border is this little town called Ramah. Well, Ramah is the only place where the northern and southern kingdoms came together to meet. And, but it wasn't a happy place to meet. Because typically those who were taking the nations and the peoples away in cap to captivity would gather them all in Ramah. You'd have in 722 when, when the northern kingdom fell, they were gathered in Ramah and then they were hauled out in 586, 587 uh, B.C., they, the southern kingdom was gathered in Ramah, and they were hauled off into captivity. Uh, so Ramah was always associated with weeping. The children of Israel are being taken away. That was the location. Now, why is Jeremiah talking about Rachel? It isn't that Rachel went to Ramah, but Rachel was a symbol of every mother in the Old Testament. You know, that's a pretty, pretty big role to play. Ramah is a symbol of suffering of all the mothers in the Old Testament, okay, because of the deportation of all the sons. Now, Rachel was, remember, Jacob's favorite wife. She gave birth to Joseph and to Benjamin. Joseph was the father of Ephraim. The northern kingdom is often called Ephraim, okay? So when the northern kingdom really was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Rachel, so Rachel, from her, in a sense, from her womb, gave birth to the northern kingdom. Rachel also bore Benjamin. Benjamin is often identified with the southern kingdom, with Judah. So Jeremiah sees Rachel standing at Ramah, right there between the northern and southern kingdom, where the deportations happen. Rachel is weeping because she sees both sides of her family being taken into captivity. She's the symbol of the weeping mothers of the nation. That's who Rachel is. So Matthew shows us this image at the birth of, the Christ, of, birth of Christ. He sees the slaughter of the innocents as Rachel beginning to weep all over again. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Matthew picks up the statement by Jeremiah in chapter 31. He sees Rachel weeping for her children because she was like the mother of all Israel the mother of all Israel. So Rachel weeps again. This time she's not weeping because of the Babylonians or the Assyrians coming to destroy her people, but it's Herod who's destroying her people. It's the leader of the nation that's ordering a slaughter of the innocents. And the consolation follows immediately because this also brings the 
Christ into the world. He's going to come back from Egypt, and the gospel will go out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, they will come into the kingdom because of the work of Jesus Christ. So the innocents in Bethlehem, the surrounding area, were really the first casualties in a war not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual things, against the principalities of the air, against Satan himself. And we have to remember that when we look at these things in the Old Testament. This is not just a war against Herod. It is Satan using these individuals in an attempt to destroy the Christ. He knew he couldn't, but he was trying his best. So remember, the battle of this life is not against a political party we don't agree with. It's not against a legal system or a legal type of government that we don't like. It's not against my neighbor. Um, everybody here is fallible. Everybody here is tainted by sin. The real battle we have in this world is against the things that we don't see. Now, Satan may be using systems. He may be using people, but our battle is against him. It is against the evil things that come against the church, the evil of this present age. As believers, that's the enemy, and that's the only one we have to deal with. And Christ is the only one that can. So we can't go and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to face this Satan. I'm going to take him. No, Christ has already been victorious, and it is only through Christ that we can be victorious in the same way. It is Christ who knew no sin, who came into this world and became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So when we look at this chapter in Matthew and see these places, all of these things go and they fulfill what the Lord had planned hundreds of years before Christ was born and really before he created anything else. This was the Lord's plan that Christ would come for us. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, well, this is, uh, sometimes these, these things are tough to see, but you lay them out in your word and you give us this understanding that these things were foretold about Christ long before he was born. But he comes as the fulfillment of a system of sacrifices that, that could never really wash away sin, could never really atone for our sin. But he came as a babe and lived a sinless life in order to give that life for us, to atone for our sin, to take away that blemish, to make us right so that we might come into your presence washed in his blood, there according to his finished work. And then, of course, your word promises that we too shall come out of the grave when Christ returns. So, Lord, in, in these days when we look at his birth, remind us there is so much more to the birth and the life and the death and the resurrection and the eventual return of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number 213, our next carol, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly. and holy infant lowly for his bed a cattle stall oxen lowing little knowing Christ the babe is Lord of all swift are winging angels singing Noel's ringing tidings bring Christ the babe is Lord of all, Christ the babe is Lord of all. Far 
flocks were sleeping, shepherds keeping vigil till the morning new. Saw the glory, heard the story, tidings of a gospel true. Thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praises voicing, greet the morrow, Christ the babe was born for you, Christ the babe was born for you. Christ the babe was born for you. Christ has died for you. Perhaps you've never seen it. Perhaps you've never been able to collect, connect the dots in this way before. But today, perhaps the Lord is speaking to you. He says, uh, you're mine. Today is the day that you will believe. Today is the day you will understand that Christ came for you and gave his life for you. Today is the day you will believe upon him as your Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, dismiss us today with your blessing that we may go out renewed in our understanding, or maybe even for the first time, saying, yes, this is true. I don't know exactly what's going on, but this is what I must do. I must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Send us out, Lord, that we may live these things, that we may experience your grace each and every day, that we may trust you for those things that we cannot see, that we do not understand, but know that you are in control. Lord, make your face to shine upon us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. Oh!